So first, I'd like everybody to just introduce their school district, their demographics, so you can have an understanding of where they come from, and then we can go into what they've uh, succeeded at within their schools. So Tracy. So I'm Tracy Besgrove from Birdville, Texas. Now what's funny about that is it's actually six different cities. We're a suburb of Fort Worth, Texas. So Birdville is the name of the school, but there's no longer a Birdville city by itself. Um, our total population in the area is 120,000. I didn't know that. Christina looked it up for me. That's awesome. Our student population in our 31 schools, we have a total of about 26,000 students, three high schools, seven middle schools, and 21 elementary schools. As a district, we have a, an average of about 58% low um, SES or free and reduced. However, we, we have a large disparity. So some of our schools might be as high as 90% free and reduced lunch, and other schools might be as low as 20%. So that's kind of an interesting thing about our district. Is What's the next slide? And the most interesting thing would be our change in demographics over time. I can speak to this personally as I went to school K-12 in this district, and I have had my 23-year career in this district. So literally, I've been there since I was five. So I can describe those changes at a very personal level. But essentially, we have a huge shift in what used to be a very affluent area is now majority low income and the ethnicity has changed, which is something very unique for our school board, for our population of teachers to relate to our students because many of them came from this district as well. So they're not, they, they've had a hard time with this change. It's also changed the... Uh, the, what's going on in our programs. So like we talk about, it's not, you know, a lot of times we focus on ethnicity and low SES to raise students out of poverty, but really we have also a problem with our low income of white households and those students performing as well. So it's an interesting dynamic that's going on that I think is really going on all over the country. So I think it's pretty important to point out and I think that might be all for me. Okay. Um, thank you, Tracy. Next up is Elizabeth from Northeast High School, Philadelphia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Allison said, I'm Elizabeth Fernandez Vina from Northeast High School, and we are located in the northeastmost portion of this map. Uh, it's a, a school that was built in the 1950s as a white flight school, so public transportation uh, doesn't really go out to where our school is, but many of our students do take public transportation to school. Uh, it's become a largely immigrant working class neighborhood. So um, if you notice in the top left, go back, uh, that shows our uh, income, which is $30,000 a year or less per household. And then if you look at the bottom left, it shows the census from 2010, which represents our neighborhood. And as you will see, our school certainly represents the demographics of our neighborhood. So we have uh, 2,900 plus or minus students uh, down from about 3,800 when I started there. Part of that has happened because of students uh, deciding to go to uh, virtual charter schools, charter schools, um, and other neighborhood schools now that they can decide to travel. Uh, we have about 500 students in our ESOL program currently, but many of our students are also exit ESOL students. So uh, when we look at our numbers, a large percentage of our students were not born in the United States. Oh, keep, go back. Um, additionally, uh, unlike many schools, a third of our school is represented by a magnet school, which was started in the 1960s as a STEM program, so ahead of its time. And so these students come from all over the city. But something I'd like to highlight is that even though 33% of our school is represented in the magnet program, it only represents 60% of our AP program and we're working towards uh, e changing that even further. When I started at Northeast five years ago, 80% of the students in the AP program were from the magnet program, and so it was seen as an extension of that school, and we're trying to change that. So as we grow the program, we're not decreasing the number of magnet students, but we are increasing the number of non-magnet students to sort of make those percentages work. 
84% uh, of our students are free and reduced lunch, uh, which is up from 40% about six years ago. So as you see this increase in free and reduced lunch, um, which is how we measure our poverty rate, and an increase in the, um, in the demo or change in the demographics in our school, our AP scores have increased, and so has the uh, percentage of students in AP. And then uh, 56 are categorized as special ed. 56 languages are represented, so um, I, would, I like to say that there's no majority and no minority at Northeast High School. Uh, and so that's represented by ethnicity, which you can see for yourselves. It's tough to read, but um, it's about 33% black, 22% uh, Asian, 19% white. Um, I think it's about 17% Latino. I have to, can't do the math that quickly. And then, uh, as you see, our ninth grade classes are pretty large, so we, and our senior class does go down to below about 600. So we do deal with issues of dropout rates and other, um, we have other issues that many schools in the country face, especially in the inner city. And so as I mentioned, um, and we can just quickly go through this, our student population has decreased as our free and reduced lunch uh, rate has increased. And so we're really proud of our AP gains in particular because of that. And then uh, Elizabeth, how many assistant principals do you have at the school? Uh, five, four? Okay. It depends. So we've had significant budget cuts in the last year and so We've lost a lot of staff and we're slowly rehiring some, some folks. So we have no librarian. Uh, we started off the school year with one counselor for 3,000 students. Um, we lost 26 teachers last year and we lost 20 the year before that. So I've been really fortunate to be able to keep my job. Um, and we lost assistant principals. Our entire administrative team with the exception of two people is new this year. Um, so, so we're dealing with a lot of change and change that we didn't necessarily want to happen. Thank you. And next up, Dr. Lipfin from Tustin. All right. Um, I'm going to go really quick through, quickly through this, but easiest, find, uh, easiest place to find, uh, I can just reference Disneyland. We're pretty close to that. Most people know where that is. Um, but Tustin uh, serves three different uh, major cities in this area. It's down in Orange County, right by John Wayne Airport. Uh, Tustin, Irvine, and Santa Ana. Um, so uh, we have 28 schools, uh, three major high schools, and then there's a continuation adult school that I did not list there. About 24,000 kids. Uh, the thing that's important, <clears throat> a lot of people like working with Tustin uh, from a publishing perspective, from a um, research perspective because we have almost mirrored demographics to the state of California. Um, so we're a microcosm of the state um, and it's a fairly good sized sample. Uh, so a lot of people really like to look at, at us. Um, the one place where we are beating, beating the odds, I guess, when you consider that sample size, um, we do have a fairly high grad rate. Uh, and once you extend a little bit, it actually gets up in the, about the 98 range. Um, but our initial grad rate is 96.2. Um, and about 80% of our kids do go on to four-year college. So that's a pretty high rate uh, when you consider that we, are, we do have that demographic set. Um, we have sp specific uh, four-year MUN program, AP program, IB, and then early college, where we actually have about uh, last year, it was about 60 kids who get their AA before they get their high school diploma. Um, so we have uh, we have kind of the the realm. We have a third of our kids on free and reduced, but then we also have uh, a third of our kids whose attorney will talk to you or their nanny every time uh, you know that there's an issue. So you you deal with a wide variety of people, and uh, it's a it's a great city and a, a great place to work because you get that full gamut. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, great. And Charles Mize. Hi, I'm, I'm Charles Mize, um, the assistant principal at Indio High School. Um, for most of us who even know Indio, it's more in the area of the Palm Springs area, the California desert. So me coming out here, it's actually cold. Um, just real quick, um, a lot of your students would probably know where we are. We are the home of the world famous Coachella Fest, which happens every April. And if you're a country western fan of uh, two week long events called Stagecoach, we also have the Tamale Festival, which is pretty internationally around. We have about 1,000 companies come out and do that in our city. My high school is about 2,000. We used to be a little bit larger. 
But five years ago, we opened up a seven, second high school in the city of Indio, so we went from about 2,700 down to 2,000. My high school was 95% Hispanic. 48% um, of them are English learners. Um, and we are, I think this year, about 88% free and reduced lunch. Um, we are the, the poorer school in my school district. We are also in, this, in the school district that includes cities such as Ranch, um, Rancho Mirage, Indian Wells, Palm Desert, the country club cities. And so we are definitely the, the opposite side of the tracks in the sense of our area. Great, thank you. So we have the desert, we have Disney, we have Philadelphia, and Texas. So obviously you can see there's a vast um, geographical difference, demographic difference, but in terms of accomplishing great things with digital curriculum, uh, these four individuals have um, done an amazing job incorporating Schmoop as well as a variety of other resources. So at this point, I'd like for um, each of you to just talk about some of the biggest challenges and what your goal was to do within your district. Well, when um, I started in this position, I really wanted to find ways to help teachers target content needs and diagnose those content needs appropriately. Especially with AP teachers, that's really difficult to talk about because they don't think they have any content needs. They understand it, and so they don't necessarily think they need much help with it. But, so that was also a barrier. But really what I wanted was for them to not think of the Schmoop offering as online prep, but to take those little quotations from around the words online so that it's really about a student taking ownership and responsibility for their own needs that a student can leave their classroom and choose to do preparation for their course, that that teacher doesn't necessarily build or lead or directly instruct. And when you talk to AP teachers about that, that makes them a little frightened because they're a little controlling. I don't know if you've met any of them. But so that's really, um, we, we could, I could say all day long that the barriers were, you know, we don't have the one-to-one -one initiative. We have bring your own device, but we don't have enough bandwidth. I mean, we could talk about those, those issues that come with devices all day long, but it's really about the concept of how teachers and students view preparation and confidence in the content. And so that's what we faced, I faced. Sure, let's um, go on. So order. Yeah. one of our initial goals was really, it really started from changing from having a very fixed mindset about ourselves and our students to, have, to changing to having a growth mindset. So what I mean by that is that we could reflect and think about our practice, what we were doing in the classroom, what we were providing for our students, and thinking about our students and what resources and access they had. So we overhauled the entire program, um, and many of the teachers initially said, well, I teach the AP students, they're the best and the brightest, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that they succeed, and unfortunately, they're not. We were at 80%, 80 percent of our exam score to one at that time. And we started thinking about extending class time with limited resources. How do we do that? Our students have smartphones, so how do we connect with them? What spaces are available in the building for them to come together to study? What can we do with Saturdays? Our building's open on Saturdays for recreation. Why can't we take advantage of the classroom? So we started thinking about everything that we had, not necessarily the obstacles, and we put everything on paper, and then said, what is feasible? And, and that's how we started to change. So our initial goal was really to lower ones and to make sure that we were providing for our students. And then it just became a... Um, it just, I see everyone looking back, so I, <laughs> what's back there? Uh, and, and building a community. So we started also having um, community building events. We go ice skating now every year. We go to a Phillies game at the end of the year after AP exams. And so now it went from students taking AP classes to students becoming AP students and AP scholars. And that was an unintentional outcome of, of what we started doing. And I really think that um, just by taking baby steps and not, to use the words that we use this morning, becoming intoxicated with potential, but just taking it one step at a time is really how we got to where we are. Wonderful. Grant? All right. And, and I put all my answers on the slide, so I don't. Um, but uh, some, of the things that, uh, some of the things that I didn't share before, though, uh, really quickly, 
Um, we, we really did face a lot of obstacles, but a lot of our obstacles are also advantages when you really look at it. Um, we, we have uh, Jonathan Blackmore's in the back. He's the Tustin High principal. Um, but he's been working with his school for about four years, I believe, with Schmoop, um, and has had a lot of tremendous success with AP. Um, but we've also been really fortunate in our district that bandwidth issues are not a problem. We got a $130 million tech bond that we have to use just for technology. Um, so our infrastructure is just ridiculous. Um, and we have one-to-one -one programs and things like that that we're putting into place. So we're really looking for a full digital transformation um, and not just to put a, um, you know, a book onto a device or just have a really cool website, but really to change teaching um, and really change learning um, night and day from what it was. Um, and we don't have huge problems. We have high socioeconomics overall. Um, so we are trying to force change in an area where a lot of people think we didn't need a lot of change, and that is kind of a, a hard time, but with Common Core, we thought it was perfect timing to do something like that. Um, so a lot of the things that we have for major obstacles with this curriculum are ob obstacles to handing an a iPad as well or something like that to a student to walk home through three gang neighborhoods. Um, with $800 in their back pocket, you know. So we had different things like that to consider. Um, whether they have internet at home, um, which we have solutions for those things, just the sheer size of it. But also, how are we gonna, how are we really gonna change things with this? Um, how are we gonna get better results? How are we going to uh, change teaching in the classroom? How are we gonna extend the school day? Um, and then uh, really take the tutor market away um, we have a really strong tutoring market, and it creates such an imbalance between our rich and our poor. Um, and you especially see that in AP, and I think it's the genius of what Schmook can do. Um, and it's also the genius of people that are visionary, like Jonathan, and are able to see that this helps lower and close that gap. Um, because for free, essentially, for our kids, um, once they log in, uh, they're able to access AP is a perfect spot because they can take those tests five, seven times. I can't remember how many times, but uh -huh. at least five times practicing. In the past, only the rich kid that could get a Kaplan book or uh, go sign up for a, a crash course or something like that actually has that access or can pay for a tutor or something like that. This really levels the playing field. Um, and provides a lot of those opportunities for kids. So we were really looking for, for that. Um, from a teacher training perspective, we were really worried as well that our, uh, our certain demographic of teachers that were pretty set in their ways and not digital native were just gonna be afraid of using the internet, period. Um, but with that $130 million tech bond, we hired 13 digital learning coaches that are specifically to train teachers um, and provide PD every day, all day, um, and mentor people. So um, so a lot of things that I, I could complain, but I'm, I, I would not have a lot of sympathizers, I don't think. Um, and then the other things that we we're concerned about is obviously cost, too. When we we're talking about the scale that we have, um, we, we, we had some big, ambitious goals. Um, but we had things like Play-Doh, and we have all of these other digital resources that are out there, and they cost a fortune in digital books, and then you throw an $800 iPad on the top of it or whatever, and it starts to add up, and $130 million, it sounds funny, but it doesn't go very far with 24,000 people over 30 years. So um, we have so much to take into uh, consideration, but from a curricular perspective, the bang for your buck with um, this particular um, program and as wide ranging as it is, uh, it's just incredible. Um, you know, if you look at a digital, even the most interactive digital textbook, about 62 to 80 dollars is about as cheap as you can get it. So, um, this is just a tremendous value for what we've been able to get. So, we were, uh, and I don't work for Schmoop, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it really, and we were also looking for a one stop shop. Um, we needed, we want one login for everything to make it easy for parents, right. to make it easy for kids, so we don't have to hire an entire IT person just to manage everything that was going on. And this also serves that purpose, so thank you. Thanks, Grant. You're hired if you'd like right. to. Uh, Charles? Um, 
Well, the story with Shmoop and Indio High School actually goes back about four years ago. Um, when California decided to push for the Race for Top grant, um, my high school was put on the chronically underperforming list. Um, we had an API that was pretty much stuck around 640. And so we were placed on this list and pretty much we were given a year to turn it around. Um, we came up with a bunch of plans. One of our plans was to start, um, we went from the six period schedule to an eight period schedule to design more support classes for definitely our struggling students. That left us with a, sort of a good problem and we weren't exactly sure what to do with our top students. Um, and so I was assigned with the task of finding some curriculum for our low level students, our middle level students, and our high achieving students. I was up at a conference and I happened to run into Paul Taylor. Um, and he started telling me about, well, we can help you with CASI, we can help you with the ELs, we can help you with AP, we can help you with SAT, we can help you with ACT. And I said, okay, and I went and talked to some other people. They were much more expensive, so I came back to Paul Taylor. Um, <laughs> and that sort of began our relationship. Um, he mentioned earlier the one thing that I think was the easiest for me to sell my staff was that it was one website. One, every student, because I have students that are English learners, that are in AP classes, that are struggling to pass the math portion of the exit exam, and they have one login, one website, and a teacher that is, they were able to go to that one website. And so we started using the word schmoop, schmoints, all over campus that is like 95% Hispanic. Um, but. I think because of that, I also was able to reach my staff in a very easy way in the sense of there was only one stop for pretty much all of our problems. Um, with the support from the extra support classes from going to the eight period over two days, block scheduling, we were able to raise our test scores. We, would, we didn't get fired, thankfully. Um, but we also have seen an incredible growth in our students, on, our, on all of our higher achieving students in the sense of AP, SAT. ACT as they became a priority in getting also the help that they needed at a low income school. Wonderful. So to segue to that, let's talk about the results that I would like for each of you to brag about. Um, you have seen tremendous improvements with your test scores. So um, let's, we'll go back around and start with Tracy. I, I think they're slides. Yes, they are. But, so they're, okay. Um, all right, so with Schmoop, and actually what's up there right now has changed, but I did buy this district-wide for all three of our high schools and some middle schools if they would convince me they, they had reason to be on it. I said yes. I've essentially told no one no, which is a fun, a fun, a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but since, this, since I did this, um, Allison came out and we did a Go Visit the World. And in February alone, I've signed up almost 500 more students because of that push. And our number of, of uh, hours on the program has increased by, in just one month, I think by over 300 hours. So really, this goes back to that goal that I had in the beginning about students realizing they can take responsibility for their learning and do things on their own. So even if they've signed up under, even if they've joined a teacher's class, they're still having to do this most likely on a device that is not school provided because we don't have a one-to-one -one initiative and I just dropped everything and she's picking it up for me. So that is extremely exciting to know that, that students are on their own realizing that prepping for AP, SAT, PSAT, can be done on their own, and that is extremely exciting. The other thing, I think there's another slide, maybe. Are we just talking about schmoop results, or? Okay, I only have one slide, so there. My, my schmoop results are awesome, and to be determined on this year's scores. Uh, and now, uh, Elizabeth, can you please brag about the wonderful results that you've seen, despite librarians, counselors, money, anything? So I'd like to add that our student to computer ratio is, I always get it backwards, but it's one to nine. So we have uh, nine students for every one computer. And if you really break that down and think about the desktops that are in classrooms, it's actually worse than that. So when thinking about how to implement Schmoop, we had to think about what's feasible, as I said before, and, and what do all of our students have access to? 
not all of them have access to a smartphone, but most do now. And most of them have access to a library down the street. And up until last June, they had access to our school library, which has about 40 computers. So um, when we talked about the change that we made in our program, it was about student autonomy, students taking control of their learning. And we were just there to guide them and provide them with opportunity. So that's how we were able to use Schmoop. So if you look at this bar graph, um, the bottom number shows the number of students involved with our AP program. In 2011, you'll see an increase um, in students, and that's because we had an increase in federal funding, and so we were able to have an eight-period school day. We now have a seven-period school day, which limits the number of AP course offerings that we can have, and therefore the number of students who can take them. You can also see um, an increase in the number of exams ordered, and I'm happy to say that this year I will be ordering about 700 exams. So our numbers have stayed the same, but the number of students taking each exam has, or the number of exams each student will be taking has increased. I also have to add that all of the data that I'm going to share represents all of our students taking the exam because the school district, thankfully, um, does pay for every student to take our exam. So when I show you our data, it represents the entire population of AP students. Oh, okay, so this, this graph is the one I'm most proud of and seems to be the most popular. Uh, if you see the top line, it shows the number of ones our students scored over the years. So we were at 76% in 2007. Um, and now we were down to 46% last year. And so the middle number, the middle line, represents the number of college eligible exams, which is threes, fours, and fives. Our goal for this year is to have those uh, lines flip-flop so that we have more college eligible exams than, than one. So that's what we're working towards this year. Oh, and um, I just wanted to also add, we had zero AP scholars in 2007 and 22 last year. So um, the number of students getting a three or more on three or more exams has also increased uh, dramatically. Um, our school-wide uh, college going rate in terms of matriculation is 63%, but for our AP students, I just disaggregated the data, and it's at 86%. And this year, um, if you see CCP is the largest, so this to the left, you'll see where our students have been accepted to and where they've decided, or not where they've decided to go, where they've been accepted to. And CCP is our community college in Philadelphia. Now, if you go to the slide with the college acceptances for this year, um, these are the schools to which our students have been accepted to thus far as of last Friday at Northeast. So uh, you'll notice some changes. We have um, lots of local uh, top tier schools and our students are exploring schools other than Temple, Penn State, uh, LaSalle, Drexel, which are our local universities. So we're really happy about that. We also have had students this year with interviews to Stanford, MIT, Princeton. Uh, so we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed for them. These are our statewide standardized test scores. They're included um, simply because it shows the, the school-wide performance on our state test. Our state test recently changed, but it's about 54%. So um, we have definitely have some work to do, but this is sort of to give you an idea of what type of school we are coming from. And I don't know if there's anything else. Can you tell the story about the AP computer science program that you're gonna put together next year? Uh, so um, this year we have five students I probably shouldn't say their names, it's gonna be difficult, uh, who approached me in the beginning of the year and said, Ms. Fernandez, if we teach ourselves computer science and put together a course and we teach it ourselves, um, can we take the test at the end of the year? And so I said, well, if you prove to me that you have the content knowledge to do that, then sure, because the school district pays for the exam. So they've been staying after school, teaching themselves uh, AP Computer Science and actually using uh, Schmoop to help them along the way because we don't have a teacher to help them. And I just gave them their practice test and they will be taking the exam. So then some underclassmen approached me and said, Ms. Fernandez, can we get AP Computer Science next year? And I always like to say yes. 
So I said yes, but you have to put together a proposal and get 33 signatures because that's the number of students that we need to have in a class to be able to have a teacher for them. Uh, and each of those students needs to write why, computer, why they want to take this class. So last week, I got a proposal on my desk with 33 signatures, and now I have to figure out how to actually <laughs> approach my administration to get this class. But I think um, what this story shows is that not only are teachers taking initiative in our school, but students are to make things happen. And when you do have a grassroots culture, uh, like we have at Northeast, things can happen, change can happen, despite everything that's going on, um, both locally uh, and also nationally in terms of, of the political scene. So um, this story is just telling about how our school culture has changed and how student ownership is really important when thinking about making change in a school. Thank you. And that's with six snow days already that you've accumulated. We've had six snow days, yeah. We no longer have spring break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now on to uh, Tustin and Grant. Yeah. Um, we have expanded now, so um, all of our high school students have access, and now all of our middle school students have access. So um, they're using it. That's new this year. Um, our best data on, on Schmoop use comes from Tustin High. So. Um, I have that information right here, um, and you can kind of see the longitudinal results of this, but this is with a fairly stable um, number of kids involved with the school, um, but our number of test takers hasn't changed dramatically, um, but the number of scores three or above have gone up dramatically since uh, the start of um, Schmoop use at this particular school. Um, also, uh, I, I think that's the biggest thing, is that um, it's not hard for us to convince kids to take AP classes or to take, um, and, and this is our lowest, from a socioeconomic perspective, this is our lowest socioeconomic high school. Um, the other two are considerably um, higher from a socioeconomic perspective, um, especially the one that's located in Irvine. Um, they have many, many more Te, uh, students that are taking AP and many more people who are um, who, who are taking multiple AP tests, but uh, the biggest growth has been with closing that achievement gap and providing a level playing field. And um, Jonathan's done an excellent job of, of utilizing this and his and making this known to his teachers. Um, and you can see that here. Uh, Jonathan, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is there anything I'm missing about your school in particular? I think most importantly, with us for Schmoop, and one of the issues that we dealt with was, was the, the whole um, issue of, of equity and access for our students. And we do have a very, very large AVID population. Um, we did it, we, we encourage our AVID students to take advanced placement courses, especially in their 11th and 12th grade year. Um, we also use the AP Potential Program to identify AP students and, 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 and encourage them to enroll in advanced placement. So knowing that we're taking um, students that have, you know, historically not, not taken a, a college preparatory course load, they, they don't have help at home, they're gonna be first generation college students when they go to college. What could we do to, to help them and, and make the curriculum accessible for them, and that's really where Schmoop has bridged the gap for our students. Um, and it, it's our students have become drivers of Schmoop, and they drive the teachers, especially our AP teachers, especially within our AVID program, especially within our honors and AP courses. The teachers are, are the students learn it as, as quickly or, or more effectively, and then they go back and teach the teachers, which has been a really, really great transformation for us. Yep. Uh, can we go to the slide that was right before this, really quick? Um, something that I know jumped out at me, uh, specifically this year, and I'm really anxious to look at um, scores about it. Um, we have never used this in our continuation high school before. Um, and this year, um, our continuation high school principal was, became aware of it, um, and they put it into to really heavy use with uh, Casey and passing the high school exit exam. And uh, so it's a high EL population, um, very low socioeconomic typically. And uh, we had, uh, I think we only had 50 students who needed to pass it this year and 43 kids 
were some of the heaviest users of Schmoop in the KC prep area. 43 of the like 72 kids that we had that were really focusing in that area, they spent something like 900 hours on KC prep um, on Schmoop. And I think 900 hours might be more hours than they've gone to, some of these kids have gone to school. <laughs> um, and, and, and that it is kind of a funny statement to think about, but you don't end up at continuation by having stellar attendance. Um, and, uh, and so it's really amazing. It struck a chord with that particular group of kids where they believe in it, it's entertaining, um, it's kind of funny, and they get immediate feedback. Those are all things, and they get schmoints, they get all of these little extrinsic things that they may not get with somebody else. They don't have to connect with the teacher, they don't have to show up on time, they can pull it up wherever they want to. Um, it's just, it's available, um, and, uh, and it's quality, and I, I can't wait for scores to go up so I can say that's why. Um, so it's kind of a, a cool thing, but I'm really anxious to see what those 43 kids that spent that amount of time, uh, I know that they passed the exit exam, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I can't wait to see, you know, more quantifiable data on those 43 kids. Right. And that's a, a great segue over to Charles because Charles done, has done a fantastic job at Indio hitting all levels within um, test prep in increasing the KC rates, increasing the AP scholars, as well as SAT and ACT. Well, um, one of the, and it's sort of been the theme here all day in the sense of the, what happens with poverty in the sense of with schools. One of the, the ways that we approached with having Schmoop is that we, we know most of our students don't have internet at home. Um, or if they do have internet, it's dial up. Or if it's a computer that is incredibly slow on today's internet. And so this is why we said we have to reach these kids on campus. We have to open up our library. We have to open up earlier. We have to close later to give them the opportunity to be on the internet and surf the web on a site that's going to help them be smarter. And it was sort of a cult. We needed to make a cultural shift. Um, and this goes from, like I said, all the levels. My, my English learners that are struggling to pass the Cassie part and the ELA, they, they see it in English. They see it in Spanish. They're able to get more comfortable. Um, and I think that plays a very large part in why we're able to get my EL, my CELT level 2s and my CELT level 3s to be able to pass that test at 75% on their initial test that's going to become, well, in March, the one that's coming up in a couple weeks. Um, I think this also goes to why we've been able to be more successful. Our, our, I'm not sure if it's up there. Well, there's, there's our results for CELT. These are our CELT, one, our CELT twos and threes. This is their pass rate um, now as 11th and 12th graders. And you know, CELT two, for, CELT two has very limited English. A lot of these are newcomers that have been in the United States less than four years. And they're being able to pass at 75% now. It, it used to be under 50%, and this, this led to our dropouts. Um, and it, it has just really helped us get them to be confident walking into the exam. This also, I think, has been a huge reason why we've been able to increase our scores on the AP exam. Um, like, like Philadelphia, I track not just the three, four, fives, we track the twos. Um, and the reason why is when I took over the program four years ago, and I always look at the AP European History exam as my example. This is t they're typically done in our high school 10th graders. It's their first huge exam that they take in the sense of a college level. I would say I test about 100 kids. I would say 50 of them had quit within an hour of the exam. And probably the other 45% had quit about, about lunch break. Um, now when we take that exam, because they've been on Schmoop and they've taken two, three, four practice exams, they walk in with a confidence of, I could get a three. And they finish that exam. And when I say stop three and hours and 45 minutes later, they're like, oh, man, I got one more question. I can finish it. Give me five more minutes. And as an educator, it's so wonderful to see that they want more time to take an AP exam versus when do we get out of here? Um, and that's why I think why we've seen the score. It is a cultural shift of... I could do better. I mean, when, when I took over the program, we had two AP scholars, and both of those were students that were accepted to UC Berkeley. This past year, we had 25. Um, and one of them, had our, he's, a, he's a senior this year, he's already passed seven AP exams. 
And the pressure on our campus right now is, you see the incoming juniors, I want to be an AP scholar. I could pass seven, I could pass six. We, we went from a school that had two, three years ago on the entire campus, and now kids are like, I could pass seven. I mean, it is just a cultural shift, and it all has to do with them being comfortable with the exam. And I brought an example, what we used to do. This is a Barron's book, 2009 English language. I have about 100 of these in the library. I think this was the one that was most used. I think pages one, two, and three have some writing in it. We bought these for years and years and years and never got results. And all the books look brand new. Well, this is now five years old. And it didn't work. And now that we've gone to technology, kids do it at home, we've been able to show them ways, well, ways to cheat and get more points. but in essence, we're showing them how we studied in college. You sit with two or three of your buddies that are taking AP Calculus, and you hammer out how to get that right question. And it's clicked with them. That's not cheating. This is what we need to do. And our scores have gone up. Last year, I, I, I don't know why I used AP Calculus as an example. Every single one of our AP scores showed a measurable gain, except AP Calculus, um, <laughs> which is the irony. And I, this year, I'm, I'm measuring um, how our students have done on the SAT for the class of 2014. I think it's up there. We are expect, let's see, it was mentioned earlier. Well, there's our gains. We have grown 38 points on the writing portion of the SAT this year. Uh, math 34, reading 46. We have increased our levels to where students were scoring a little bit under 400. And we used to test only, I would say, about the top 75 students of a class of 500, which are pretty much kids who are already going to be A through G, pretty much going to be able to go to at least a Cal State. I'm now testing about 130 kids of my graduating class this year. So mathematically, my score should have gone down because I'm now using students 76 through 130. But it's sort of fed into them. We could do better. They take those practice tests. Um, like your example, like the math shack. Things like this that have been used, they're getting more and more comfortable and they walk out of the exam thinking they did good instead of walking out deflated. Um, you know, and, and we've seen other results. I mean, I've, my ACT this year, I've seen an increase of at least one full point in all three portions of the ACT. And we, I went back, I could go back about six years. We've never seen gains like this. And the only thing that we really do different is we give them schmoop and we walk in and we kind of tell them they could do it. Um, and so we're, we're very happy with, what the, with the progress that we made through schmoop right now. And we're happy too, Charles. Uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to the crowd for questions uh, as we have these wonderful educators up on the stage. Obviously, they have fantastic stories, so um, hopefully we can find out more of the things that you would like to ask them. Hi, um, I teach special ed, and I want to know what it looks like for the SPED students um, as far as their reading levels are concerned. Let's say they're reading at the fourth, fifth grade level at a high school. So how have you addressed that, and how has Schmoop um, helped um, increase their scores? I'll take that. Um, I also oversee the special ed department, so I could think. One of the things that I have done, what we have done at Indio High School is a lot of times when you look at a special ed class, the problem is reaching rigor. And this also works with my English learners as well. You, you need to teach that special ed student or that English learner at their level. And so a lot of times in the main class, it's way below the high school level. But one of the things that we did is we created support classes. Well, it, with, my, with my special ed department, we do math at the special ed level. But in their support class, we use a lot of schmoop. And we use the high school exit exam on the schmoop program as the rigor, and so we've been able to not only expose them to the problems, and when you look at like the math shack, it will bring down the rigor to the level which is very basic in the sense of the standards they need to do to pass the exit exam. And they're exposed to something that they could accomplish, and slowly we're able to ramp up the rigor to what they need to do to pass the California exit exam. Now in California, special ed students can grant a waiver to, they don't have to pass the exit exam to graduate. Our kids know that, but we've been able to get 
more than 50% of my SDC students to successfully pass the exit exam through them being exposed to the rigor of the California exit exam through SMOOP. I think the other, the other piece to, to add, you did a great job answering that, but the uh, essay lab I think is the other component of it, especially for EL. Um, especially when you're talking about passing a Casey or something like that. Um, it's not rocket science to pass that. Um, you know, the people say, well, how does a computer teach you to write? You know, and, and a lot of, and I'm not trying to offend any English teachers that are out there, but, um, but it, it's really not a, a rocket science thing. In order to pass the Casey, there's a certain level, and it's the same, it's the same thing where I've seen it be very effective in, in a special ed, from a special ed approach too, is that you have to learn to write formulaically to a certain extent just to pass. Um, and then you can talk about the artsy later. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that can be learned and can be gained from a little bit of formulaic writing. Um, and, S, and the SA Lab is able to produce that in a m number of different ways. And it has the ability to teach kind of the flowery outside stuff too. But, um, but we've seen definitely the use of it, I think, and I can go back to the continuation side of things too. It's the same, same deal. So for EL, for special ed, for continuation, um, especially when you're just trying to get, close those gaps and move kids up, uh, you got to walk before you can run, and I think the SA Lab steps kids up really, really well. Mm -hmm. I think the literature learning guides as well. I think every piece of literature you can think of is listed alphabetically, and then it gives a summary for them in, in, you know, kid language. So it's not um, difficult for them to grasp that summary piece. And it models for them what a good summary is of a story or of a poem. Um, I think it also helps teachers as well help that take a piece that might be above the, especially for ELL, their level of comprehension and bring it to the student level so that then they can move to rigor. Uh, this question goes to um, the aspects of uh, use in the middle school. I'm a middle school teacher and um, wanted to know how they were receptive to the use of Shmoop, but also how do you change, or how did you address the culture of using technology on campus, such as a mobile device, without it being, oh, um, you're using your device, give it away, and because there is a large phobia of using mobile devices for any kind of sort of thing, so we have to. Um, I think, I think uh, was that for me? Because yes. I talked about, okay. Exactly. You. Um, I, first of all, the phobia issue of, of using your own device, which that's what we have to do because we don't have a one-to-one. -one. We began a Bring Your Own Device initiative uh, several years ago. It's been met with some resistance in some areas. Middle school is one of those. But honestly, I think this has helped them see the benefit of a student getting their own mobile device out and using it for a purpose in class, which has been phenomenal. And really, it's been, because I didn't do it school-wide for middle schools, I pr presented it to some middle school teachers and said, if this is something you want to do, let me know. And so it has, you know, it has to be, in that regard, it's kind of opposite from high school, because at high school, I've just been flooding, flooding, flooding. Hey, kids, here's a trick to get you around your teachers, kind of to trick them into getting online when really I was having the same presentations for their teachers. But at middle school, I didn't, um, really it was teachers, if you want to do this. And so I've had a lot of teachers on their own take that initiative and say, this is how I think I can use it, will you let me? So that's been very exciting. Um, I foresee you know, the next step being, we would then do that push to get middle school students on it school-wide, just like we are at the high school. But it's become more of a grassroots at middle school, kind of like what you've described, than it has been at my high school campuses. Because at my high school campuses, it was this is what we have, and let's let's make everyone use it and love it. And they do. Once they get on it, they love it. It's just the question of getting them there. There's one other question. Um, what about if students are walking around, and um, I know they were talking about the gamification aspects before. Um, if the kids are at lunch or at a free time they're walking around, they're actually like literally having a competition, trying to beat each other's schmoint scores. 
Have you had any of those incidents on the high schools or something like that? I dream of those incidents. Yeah, I would give an um, award. I would. I would that. give. I would give. I would buy steak dinners um, for those students. But um, no, we haven't had that issue happen um, yet. But someday, sh we, we are schmooping over the world. So someday. You know, one of the things I would say, and I, this also falls along with all the Common Core stuff that's going down. I know at my site, it has forced us to get more computers on our campus. Um, my district is really large on the, the Chromebooks. So last year I bought five class sets that were sort of designed for classes that were sort of having to do, in essence, schmoop or other stuff like that. Um, and I know this, this year, um, we're, we're buying, we're, our, my district's buying more. Um, so I'm gonna have about 1,000 Chromebooks on my campus. Well, actually I have them now, they just haven't, I haven't given them to the teachers. Um, we just got them this week. Um, it, so there's gonna be a lot more, and I think schools are gonna get a lot more of these devices on campus because of all the money that came from, uh, from the governor because of Common Core. And I think, I think that's gonna have to disappear really quickly. I mean, I know my, princ my principal's been on site for 22 years, and he, he doesn't believe in cell phones, and so it's like, that, that attitude has got to change because there's so much good available on the internet right now to help us get through this transition that we're going to have to embrace it. And I hope that you use your technology money to buy devices that the kids can use and be mobile in some way. We didn't get that common core money. So one of our responsibilities, I think, is to, to teach students to use the devices they have in front of them well and to take advantage of what is there. So our students are going to be on their phones, whether texting or communicating otherwise. So why not teach them to use these tools to enhance their learning? Our students take public transportation uh, to school every day, and so do I. And it's great to see a student looking at flashcards on their phone or putting a post on, it's like Facebook for schools, we, we use Schoology uh, for their classmates to see or answering a question or we had an issue, uh, it's not a real issue, uh, two years ago where students created a hashtag for their APUSH class before the exam and, and that's how they were studying. So I think we need to take advantage of, of the tool that they have in front of them instead of telling them put it away because that's when we're gonna face the most problem. I think if we, if we make it taboo to use the tool, then they're going to use it for reasons that we don't want. Um, and, and so let's take advantage of what the powerful tool that they have in front of them. I think uh, we were, we're obviously, um, we benefit by the fact that our community wants technology and they voted in a bond and, and are willing to pay their own tax dollars for that. Um, so our community, in essence, wants this. But the one thing that we learned when we went for this bond is we flew all over the country looking at places that had done one-to-one -one programs and bring-your-own-device programs and everything else. And it's all with philosophy from the top down. Our superintendent believes in it. Our city and council believes in it. Our school board preaches it. We give trainings to all of them. <laughs> we give trainings to parents. We give trainings to everybody so that you can take the phobia of what kids are doing with a device away and show them what the benefit is if they're, use, if they're structured well. So that takes me to structure it well. Um, you know, th we, if there's anything that I think um, was done right, that I've seen done right in other parts of the country and, other, and done horribly wrong in other parts of the country um, where they had to learn the lesson the hard way, was you have to have the infrastructure, you have to have the board policy that supports this, you have to have parents that believe in it, you have to have teachers that are trained, but nothing uh, replaces the teacher's ability to control their own environment in their classroom. Having high expectations for kids and structuring their lesson to truly use the device to be a positive contributing factor. If free time is a killer, and that's a killer whether you got a phone in front of you or anything else, if you're giving them just free, unstructured time that's not moving you towards your target in the class, kids are gonna manipulate that. Um, so your high-end third are probably not. They're gonna be the ones on the flashcards and things like that. But the middle, bottom are gonna mess with that if they get the free time, and, and you so, a lot of it is, are you planning your lessons well? Are you using time effectively? Are you using that device and telling kids how to use it well enough so they go after more content? 
so that they're collaborating more, so that they're setting up the different opportunities that you've heard. Um, but the downtime is a killer. And, uh, but I, I would say, I honestly, I'm not being sarcastic when I give the kid who's using it at lunch an award. Um, they're gonna text anyway. I mean, I've seen kids text through their pants better than, I mean, <laughs> honestly, like any, it's, it's sad, but I mean, the kids that I've expelled or suspended for drug dealing, those kids text through their pants better than any person I've ever seen. They don't wanna give it away that they're setting something up. Um, but that's just the worst case scenario of what they're doing with that. The best case scenario is, I've also had kids check out projectors and computers and things like that because they're having AP movie night at somebody's <laughs> house and they're gonna pack 40 kids into a room to watch videos, um, you know, whether it's videos from here or elsewhere. Um, so you, you gotta see the good with the bad, you gotta structure the downtime and then it's a positive experience. Um, I, have a, I want to follow up with the, the comment about um, exposing the students to the rigor. I want to know how do you know that the students have mastered the, the rigor besides the drill and the amount of time that they've spent on that particular subject? It, is that for me? Anybody? For anyone. Like yeah. Charles? Well, I, don't know. I mean, I guess I would just look at the, d the data in the sense of when I see an SCC student pass a portion of the exit exam, we celebrate it within the special ed department. And we celebrate it when we have a, a low EL student. I have a, we also do a bi uh, bilingual alternative program at our school. We really celebrate when a student passes the, the exit exam. That is, that is the bar that we've sort of set for them. And I know when, like four years ago, they weren't passing, and so it almost was, there was no celebration because none of them were passing or only one or two were passing. And now, like I said, this year's seniors class, I believe I have, well, I have about 17 SDC students. I believe seven of them have passed at least one portion of the exit exam, and most, if, in my school, if you're classified as SDC, you're, you're pre pretty low. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real struggle for them to pass, but they've been able to embrace it, and it's just been another tool that we've used. I mean. That's the only empirical data I'd have, I'd say, other than, I mean, it's really nice to see a student that's really low say, I want to study math. I mean, normally it's like, oh, I'm ditching math class, you know, and like, no, we're going to go work on schmoints. We're going to get more schmoints today. I mean, it's, that, that's, that should be enough evidence alone that it's working, that they want to study math. And I think exposure to rigor is also something that our, at least in Texas, our teachers have to get used to as well. We went from a minimum standards test called TAX to an end of course STAR test called STAR that's essentially an achievement test of that year's content. And all of the questions are double coded. So what I mean by that is one question might have one or two processing skills along with a content skill. And so no longer are the questions just at the knowledge level on their tests that they take at the end of the year. So our teachers are having to practice this open-ended questions, higher, higher levels of thinking. You can go through Costas, you can go through lots of open-ended discussions and dialogues. But one of the things that I see Schmoop as being able to allow is having those big ideas and big questions for students and those comparisons of literature to pop culture because they are being exposed to it and they don't even realize it. It just becomes part of what they're doing, but it really is exposing them to that higher level that's required of them, again, on, on whatever state we're talking about. Um, the thing that jumps out to me uh, about rigor is that um, I'm, I'm excited about some of the future additions that I've heard with, um, with Shmoop, like being able to search it with depth of knowledge, for example, being able to f um, go through there. Um, and I, I really am a big believer in that. And I, I think the other piece of it is too, if you're talking about blended instruction or flipped instruction or anything like that, you, you have to get the lower levels of depth of knowledge. You gotta get the factual knowledge so you can go to a greater depth. Um, and I think what this does is assure the one and two um, so that it allows the teacher to be a teacher and a facilitator and uh, a person who can help kids collaborate and get you to those higher levels of depth of knowledge um, and those higher rigor levels once you get in class. Um, 
but but being able to once you can identify what's a three or a four um, you know DOK question um, when you're talking about building courses and things like that I I, I want to push that rigor but I want I want to guarantee the baseline one and two knowledge and so that I know as a teacher I'm confident with coming in tomorrow with much harder questions because I know where the baseline on my kids is. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a value and something that I'm excited about for the future. A specific example that that reminded me of in my district for middle school, we have the requirement in pre-AP social studies classes that they all begin DBQs at sixth grade. So, and then they increase in the number as they go up. But the teacher can go on and look at any of the AP social studies courses and get an example, a good, well-organized example of a DBQ that they could show in middle school. Whereas that teacher may not have had access to that before, they do now. Um, because middle school teachers, I don't know about how it works in your state, but in our state we have a lot of generalists who became middle school teachers and so their content knowledge is sometimes part of the issue when we're talking about raising rigor in a middle school classroom because they don't have the content knowledge and background. So I've also seen this as ways to help those teachers learn that rigorous need in their content. I think the other part too is in order to be funny you have to be fairly smart. Um, and the, uh, the, some of the witty humor that's involved with the site in general. Um, if you want to get the joke, you have to kind of understand it. Um, so I, I think it really motivates the higher end kid too to go, if, if they didn't get that, it kind of hurts. Um, <laughs> you know, so they have to understand why, why it was funny. And I think that in a kind of a backside way, or maybe that I know that wasn't the intent with the funny maybe, but, um, but it, it comes back and helps you with the differentiation in that sense too. And now I think that new hover feature too that will be able to explain it to the kid who maybe didn't get it. Um, I think that's going to help. And again, it's a leveling of playing fields. So. Yep. Why is this funny? We'll be on Schmoop soon. Was there one more question out there? No. Two questions. Two, okay. two questions. One, well, for, uh, one question for me, and that is, you guys have talked a lot about the <clears throat> curriculum aspect, the AP, KC, all of those. Uh, do, do any of you work on the sort of the non-core side of like the DMV or the, jo uh, or the job smorgasbord or any of those? How do you, uh, how do you uh, uh, let the th teachers know about those? The career one? Um, I've demoed a lot for our alternative campus and for middle schools. Uh, that's, one, that's one that I've done. I haven't done any of the others. At, at my school, we, all of our freshmen take a class which is sort of designed to, um, I don't know, get on a focus of a career of some kind. And they're starting to use the career, I don't know what it's, career path or career... Career test. Career yeah. test. And they're starting to look at it. I know it's called the real poop and all the... <laughs> It has, but it has a lot of information on it. I know it talks about, you know, all the kids think they're going to be rappers or movie stars or um, NBA or whatever. And, I, you know, I love it how it has, like, the odds of you becoming, like, you know, an NBA all-star. And I don't know what it is, but, like, you know, one in three million. And so it, I, I'm seeing that more and more on my campus where, all right, let's look it up. You think you're going to be a rapper? Let's, let's look it up. You think you're going to be an astronaut? Let's look it up. See how much money you're going to make. I know on our campus we do, um, I just was in a class on Friday, and they were looking up, this is in our computer tech class, they do, we do an A-plus certification class, we, and they were looking up on Schmoop how much a computer tech makes, and they were going through all the stuff they need, how much education they make, and I, I think on it it says, well, if you have a, this degree, you would be starting at like $42,000 or something like that, and if you get a master's degree or something, you'll probably starting around 60000 and so this was something that we're using in classes that it would never intend it, something that we never would, I never introduced to Schmoop, but it's just the word of mouth, like, hey, Schmoop has this career tech thing that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it has, I don't know, what, you, 300 careers or so? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it has a lot of careers, and that's something we have used. I know our students also um, did uh, the ASVAB practice. Um, the ASVAB exam is an exam we test about 150 at my site. So the kids that were um, that signed up for the ASVAB were told that they could do the, take the practice test on the ASVAB um, about a, you know when they signed up with the career center. 
So I mean, some of that stuff was used at my campus as well. Uh, we're really interested, um, especially next year as we expand our one-to-one -one programs and things like that. Um, and Paul and Elson, I, we've already had some elementary conversations about this, but uh, we're currently using EduFi as our cyberbullying and digital literacy curriculum. Um, but we're not thrilled with that. And again, I'm trying to go back to a one-stop shop approach. I like the single login. I like the fact that, um, so as I see those things added here, um, it's really exciting because um, I think if we can find a way to, to bring that in, it's really something that we're digging into right now. Um, and I'm hoping that we can make work with our middle school and high school kids, um, bringing them in and doing the cyberbullying, which we absolutely mandate. And I don't know any disciplinarian in a middle school or a high school who doesn't mandate something like that right now um, because you're dealing with a, cell, a text or a, you know, an email or something that, a fight on Facebook or something almost every single day. Um, so um, we want to say we've trained kids well in those areas and they know what our expectations are and that's part of that infrastructure that I was talking about before. Um, and I'm hoping that Shmoop can be a, a major player in helping us frame that infrastructure for our kids in that one-to-one -one program. Um, and then with the AB86, that $256 million pathway trust thing with careers um, in California, um, we have 20 different career pathways. Um, and one of the things that I'm touting here and, and hoping that will be a major player um, in getting us a portion of that money um, is that they do have the career angle and that we do have access for all of our kids to do that type of a career exploration with this um, and hopefully get them into those right pathways so that they can move on to a community college or for a year in the appropriate area. So um, that's all exciting and I'm glad it's a one-stop shop, like I said. Yep. Okay, one last question. Okay, I have kind of two. The other one, one of them is really easy, but the first one is, can you talk a little bit about um, how did you, how are you able to train your teachers? How do they get to invest in this? And the second question is, is there any way we can get emails of you guys so we can send some stakeholders to you for some information? Because we may be convinced here, but there may be others back home that aren't. That's great. Would you like to give your email address before I speak for it? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, what? My yeah. email address is ridiculous, so uh, really we got really Right, I, but you guys are okay. So, yeah, yes, we'll make I'm, every, I'm sure everybody that. gets that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but Grant, if you can talk about the training that you do at Tustin, because I think yeah. you have a fantastic program that you've built there. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I'll keep going back to the infrastructure piece. It's what we saw that made or broke any digital thing. Um, you have to think it out before you put it in. Um, and the bigger the scale is for your district, the more you have to think about it. Um, the, and it's so stereotypical and, and it's not true in all cases. I have to do my, my preemptive strike on this, but the older your population of teachers is, <laughs> the more difficult and the more walls you might have to break down. Um, but uh, we, we did uh, 13 digital learning coaches, like I talked about a little bit earlier, where their full-time job is to provide professional development, find resources, mentor people in technology, um, and try to hook people up with this. When, oh, you, you have a problem in this area? Oh, I got a solution for you. Why don't you did you get your logins? Are all of your kids on? Um, and then we send them to one person in the district. One person, Garrett Kerr is the name of the guy in our area. So for 24,000 kids, if you have a question about Schmoop or you don't know how to get on, you go to one guy. That way the messaging is controlled, the logins are easy, he has access to everything, and if not, he has their cell phone number. So, um, and, and that's been the best part, um, and I didn't get an opportunity to answer that question today, and God, am I a good salesman, I need a bonus. <laughs> but the, no, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, the best part that, that I've liked about using Schmoop, and I don't know if I'm sure you guys can, can echo this, but, um, but I do have Allison's cell phone, and I do have Paul's cell phone, and if something goes wrong, I mean, it hasn't yet, but if something went wrong, I know I could get a hold of them, and we're working on a lot of really exciting future things that aren't out there yet, um, building a lot of the courses, and and especially in the middle school level, and they've been so receptive. If um, like I said, we have a conservative community, and uh, we had a video that had an intro to it that wasn't inappropriate, but for an ultra 
conservative clientele. The kid thought it was funny, showed dad, and dad didn't like a glove snap on a, on a video that was on there for pre-calculus. Um, for his 11th grader, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> but, uh, but he didn't like the, the intro to it, but thought that the math was incredibly sound that the video was showing. So we wanted the meat, but we, didn't, we wanted it without the setup because it was really hard to um, assign something where some parents felt that it was inappropriate. And gosh, I, I'm talking about out of 300 videos or three, a thousand videos, um, one that we've had uh, any concern over. And, uh, but the responsiveness was like right now. I mean, I emailed and within a minute I had an email back. And, um, and, and that's something where you think Houghton Mifflin's going to email you back in a minute? It's not going to happen. <laughs> I give them a lot more money and they, don't get, they, won't, they won't get back to you ever. They don't care. Maybe I should ask so, for a raise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, I was going to add one of the things that I, on my site, my librarian knows Schmoop so much better than anyone else on our campus. And he, I'm, I'm really sad. He got promoted to the district office, so he's going to be gone next week. So I think I'm going to have to answer all these Schmoop questions. Uh. But having support staff know Schmoop and how, like the login, I mean, do, the magic word and all that stuff to get your account set up, it's so important to have one or two people on your site that, that could walk a class through or walk a teacher through or walk students through. Um, and I know, like, the same thing. I know Sam would call up to Schmoop all the time saying, hey, this isn't working or this kid's account's blocked or whatever. And, like, same thing. They'd be back, they'd email us back within the day saying, hey, okay, his account is open or well, this is the problem or we fixed it or something like that. So having your support staff know, um, know the ins and outs or, will help you a lot, especially like a librarian or something like that where you're having lots of computers. I find that um, having access to Allison is really great. Uh, if I ever have a question, she's certainly there. But also knowing how to use our students' as resources. The more the students use Schmoop, the more teachers will be motivated to use it and the more they will learn about it. We have a, a few early adopters in our school who will grab anything that you put in front of them and, and run with it. But what I find most um, successful or, or easiest with implementation of anything new, Schmoot being one of those things, is that as soon as students see the value in a program or something, um, then the adults run with it. So uh, there's so much that comes top down within our, within our district. And it's not adopted to the extent as it is when it comes from students and teachers. So that student ownership, you put it in front of them and, and they'll love it. And I was t talking earlier today about how our five computer science students who I thought would never be into Schmoot because it was just too witty and, and they really just like the content and they sit and do, do math problems for fun. And they're on it all the time. And then we have students who who I thought, well, they're really not so into this, and, and they're also on it. So it really reaches the masses on different levels. Um, and, and I find just that students really enjoy using it, and that's when the adults take hold of it. And in my district, I'm, I'm the person, so I call Allison a lot for help. But I have done um, you know, meetings. I've offered meetings at all of my high schools, before school, after school, during their conferences. I've told teachers they can call me, and I, it's so easy. Schmoop has done such a great job of making it so easy to learn that I can say, okay, get on your computer, log on, and here's what you're going to see. And I've done this as I'm driving to a meeting. So I'm like, okay, now just pull down that pull-down menu and go to passes, and you're going to get to where you need to go. But I'm very excited, as I talked earlier, that 500 students have logged on in just this month. I know those 500 students could have potentially increased my, um, my phone number for teachers because they're going to be calling me saying, okay, I've forgotten how to get on Schmoop and my kids are talking about it. But that's great. I don't care. Um, I've just made it where I will go to them at any time if they want to see it, know about it, or hear about it. Well, thank you very much. That was a lovely conclusion to this panel discussion.